Spain's election ends in political limbo. The Conservative People's Party won the most seats, but not enough to claim a majority. Both sides are now scrambling to build coalitions, with weeks of political wrangling ahead and the far right on the verge of power. Who will make it to the top? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Spain's election. Well, it was a nail-biting end to the Spanish elections on Sunday with results defying all the polls. Many expected the far right to win, but even with the most votes at 33 percent, it wasn't enough to declare a majority. Incumbent Pedro Sanchez, who called the snap election in May after disappointing municipal elections earlier this year, performed better than many expected with 31 percent. And now the frustrating process of coalition building will begin with smaller parties potentially becoming kingmakers. On the left, Sumar Party won 31 seats, while the far-right Vox Party won 33. Pollsters had predicted that PP and Vox together would get enough seats for working majority as a right-wing bloc. While the socialists performed better than expected, both parties with their allies still fall short of the 176 needed meaning both Pedro Sanchez and PP leader Alberto Núñez Feijó will be looking to even smaller parties to bolster their numbers, paving the way for drawn-out and potentially fruitless talks to form a government. As they both try to garner support, Feijó had this message for his competition. Our obligation now is to avoid a period of uncertainty. Spaniards today have put their trust in the People's Party. They have also said that all the political parties across the parliament must have dialogue. And as the candidate of the party that has the most votes, I think that my duty is to open the dialogue, so I can need this dialogue from the first minute, and to try and govern our country, accepting our victory in the electoral results. There has never been a prime minister of Spain who has governed after losing the elections. Well, in the weeks leading up to the vote, however, the conservative opposition party and radical Vox coalition saw some people worried. As the far right marches steadily across Europe, pollsters predicted Spain would be next. Pedro Sanchez says he stopped that. Those people who propose machismo, a regression on rights and freedoms, have failed today. And the backward-looking bloc of the People's Party with Vox has been defeated. There are many more of us who want Spain to continue moving forward than pursuing the regression path of the People's Party with Vox. Now, it could be two months of political instability in Spain. If no government is formed, Spain could face repeat elections. In the four years leading up to 2019, the country went to the polls four times after parties could not form a government. And the people of Spain are conflicted as well. I was so afraid. I lived through the far right when I was young, and I do not want to remember it. This brings me huge happiness. The polls gave more to the PP, but well, we won the elections, which was very complicated as everything was against us. With the government and all its resources, I'm so happy. So what does the future hold for Spanish politics with this inconclusive result? And what does it say about where Spaniards stand on key issues, including immigration and internal independence movements? Well, joining me now to discuss that are from Madrid, Luis Arroyo. He was a political advisor to former socialist Spanish Prime Minister José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero, and he is now the president of Advisors of Public Communication. And from Gijón, Spain, is Carlos Conde Solares, a senior lecturer in Hispanic studies at Northumbria University. Thanks both so much for being with me. Uh, Luis, I'm going to start with you and step back a little bit and tell us what was happening in Spain for pollsters to predict that the right would take this election and, and why were they proven wrong? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, the elections in Spain are, are taking in a constituency that is the province, and we have uh, 50 plus two uh, provinces here in Spain. So that means that uh, making a good, a good poll, 
a good survey means pulling at least uh, uh, 52 uh, different constituencies. So that, that makes it uh, particularly difficult to, to anticipate the results. Uh, that's mm. probably one of the reasons. The second reason is that we had elections in May, uh, just uh, two months ago, and the results were very, very nice for the right that pollster probably, pollsters uh, probably thought that the same was going to happen uh, in these uh, general elections. And the third is that we had a wonderful campaign done by the by the left, uh, who adjusted the uh, previous uh, uh, anticipations by the right. So it was very difficult to to anticipate what what the result was going to be, um, and and here we are. Okay, but on the ground, you know, when you, when you look at the general Spanish public, and when we see the other movements toward the right. In Europe, we see people very frustrated with, you know, issues including, of course, immigration. Uh, in Spain, there's a huge issue with separatist movements. What was on people's minds mostly that m kind of gave the feeling that, oh, Spain could turn not just to the right but to the pretty far right? Uh, yes, we we of course have the the, in the the independence of Catalonia as the big issue uh, here uh, right now for the right. We had also some some concerns, some gay rights, for example, on uh, cultural cancellation. We had a couple of, of cases in the last uh, month uh, with regard to the suppression of certain con content in, 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 in theater, in music, etc. So all of those things made, uh, made the left to react uh, uh, to not to permit the coalition between the Popular Party mm. and the extreme right uh, party box. Okay, Carlos, would you have identified kind of the same conditions or were there other factors involved? Yeah, yeah I broadly agree with, uh, with Mr. Arroyo's uh, analysis in this case. It was uh, a campaign in which I think that the People's Party perhaps over relied on the data that was being produced by opinion polls, in particular, uh, GAD. Uh, Got dressed the, the the institute that uh, Narciso Michavila uh, runs. I don't know about uh, Mr. Arroyo, but what I tend to do when it comes to trying to predict uh, election results in Spain is quite simply look at the results of Got dressed. Normally they are right, and on this occasion they were not. And uh, I think that uh, that uh, Mr. Arroyo is completely right uh, to note that perhaps uh, one of the reasons for this was that the uh, uh, well, the regional elections that took place in in May, um, through results that were very good for the People's Party, for uh, for the center right, but uh, crucially, there were no elections in May in uh, Catalonia, and I think that this is the uh, this is the key factor here. Uh, I think that the main reason uh, why the Socialist Party has done um, considerably better than expected is precisely because of the very strong result that Pedro Sánchez has had in Catalonia. Uh, a result that uh, has seen the, the Socialist Party win the election by a long margin in Catalonia at the expense of the Catalan nationalists, of the Catalan independentists, but nevertheless um, giving the PSOE a result that's uh, much stronger than was predicted. Hmm. And now, regarding the, the campaign that was run by, by Vox, I would say that, uh, well, you were noting the issues of immigration, which, of course, are very much alike across Europe. In Spain, uh, this is not uh, the case, and I think that this was a strategic mistake on the part of uh, of Vox. That is, the anti-migrant sentiment that you might see at the moment in in France or in Eastern Europe is not there in Spain. In Spain, uh, the, the, there aren't the same types of issues. Of course, there are problems, like in any other Western European uh, country, but not to the extent that uh, that box perhaps thought was the case. That was a campaign that, in my view, was misguided by mm. both uh, the center-right and the hard-right. Uh, interesting to hear that, and uh, Luis, I can see you agree. But uh, quickly, Carlos, do, do you think Sanchez made a mistake calling the election in the first place? I mean, do you think he regrets it now, or has it actually kind of worked out more in no. his favor than many expected? No, no, I, I don't think he regrets it. Mm. I think that the result for him was as good as could be expected. Of course, he has not won the election, let's remember that. It would be the first time that um, uh, that a party that wins the election does not go on to, um, to hold the government. Uh, but the result for Pedro Sánchez, when we take into account uh, the results of his potential coalition partners of Sumar, together with everyone else in the parliament, 
um, it is a result that at least uh, gives him a good shot at trying to reassemble the so-called uh, Frankenstein uh, government. And, uh, and I think that that's as good as Pedro Sanchez could have expected, really. Okay, the Frankenstein government. Uh, Luis, if you want to try to explain that you know, to, a, to an <laughs> audience outside uh, the country. And also, yeah. I, I need to bring up with you a twofold question here. Because you said before that people don't see the right as dangerous anymore. I explain that as well. Well, yes, for, for our audience to understand, uh, we have, a, of course, a parliamentary system. That means that you need the support of the members of parliament to, to, get, uh, to get elected president uh, of the government, prime minister. So that, and, and that means in, in this specific moment that uh, Pedro Sánchez needs not, not only the support of the members of his party, of the Socialist Party, but also the members of SUMAR, uh, which is left-leaning also, and, um, and partner in the government right now, but also he needs the support of smaller groups, nationalist groups, the, uh, the, the, um, the Basque nationalists, the Catalan nationalists, mm -hmm. and other groups, uh, uh, to a total of five or six different uh, uh, par par parliament groups that need, uh, uh, whose support he needs to get elected president. Uh, that's what some somebody has called the Frankenstein government in the sense that it's made of many supports, many small supports. Hmm. Um, and that's the situation right now. And no one is really sure that that's, that is going to be possible. Or, or we might go to, the, uh, to a repetition of the elections, something that no one really wants, but, uh, but, is, but is possible. And that's the uh, so-called Frankenstein government. Um, yes, and I, I agree with 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 uh, Carlos uh, definitely. Uh, or 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 Vox is is not is not uh, is not as as far right as other parties in uh, Western Europe, for example, in Hungary or others. Uh, is more similar to the Italian extreme right, um, and I don't think that. People in Spain uh, has the feeling that this this extreme right is so dangerous anymore. Uh, mm. However, however, at the same time, we saw the results in the regional elections in May, and some mistakes and some big mistakes were were made by the by the extreme right in the governments that that were formed with this, with the Popular Party. And many people probably realize that these guys are not uh, are not the ones that we like. They 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 still are the, the the far right, and everybody knows that. And that made probably many people in the left to mobilize and and react against uh, against a coalition between the two rights. Okay, so we're back to this point, Carlos. I'll come back to you. Uh, that now you have this, what could be political deadlock, maybe Spain will go to another election, but if we're looking at coalition building from this point, election results like this tend to give kind of disproportionate power to much smaller parties, uh, parties that tend to be on the fringes in a lot of cases. Does that worry you right now? Yes, I think that this is the main worry for uh, for most uh, moderate Spaniards. The fact uh, that Pedro Sánchez would need every single—I mean, practically every single party in Parliament, apart from uh, from PP and uh, and Vox—and that includes, by the way, the party of uh, of Carlos Puigdemont, who's uh, currently living in in Waterloo in Belgium, mm. and uh, he will probably need at least uh, Junts per Catalunya, the party of uh, of Carlos Puigdemont. To uh, to abstain in uh, um, in a potential investiture of of Pedro Sanchez, it's going to be very difficult to put together such a, a broad coalition of parties. It's going to be even harder, much harder, in fact, than uh, than the current setup. And the current setup is already very pre uh, precarious. So there is a possibility that we might go to a repeat election. But uh, those who have the power ultimately to decide whether they want that or not are going to be the Catalan independentists. Uh, now, mm -hmm. something else to bear in mind is that in early 2024, we are likely to have uh, a Catalan regional election as well. 
and this is something that will come uh, to play. That is the rivalry between the two uh, camps in the Catalan nationalist um, spectrum, between Esquerra Republicana and Junts per Catalunya. And uh, neither of them wants to be seen as a collaborator with the Spanish government. Uh, so because of that, I think that that's the last uh, hope, really, for the right, that there is a repeat election and that somehow they do better than they did last time. But if there is a repeat election, and I think that this is going to open a very interesting scenario, I think that both uh, the PP and Vox will need to rethink their strategy quite radically, and they might even have to rethink their candidates as well. Very interesting. Um, but I mean, going back quickly, Luis, I just want to finish with this, um, you know, this, this scenario, because we love to identify those so-called kingmakers in elections like this. Like we said, we're hearing that it could be Puigdemont and the Catalan separatists, maybe to a lesser extent, former Basque separatist parties. I shouldn't say former even in this case. Uh, they might hold the key, but that could all bode pretty well for Pedro Sanchez, who will remember pardoned several of them, nine to be exact, back in 2017. I mean, was that a smart strategy then, if you look in hindsight, to what he may have to look toward now and trying to form? A coalition? It was it was uh, an intelligent strategy to to have the elections in advance uh, uh, from uh, May, I think. Secondly, uh, Pedro Sánchez was always was always very he wasn't very strong in terms of alliances around. He had always to get to a commitment between different political uh, uh, political groups. The issue here is that the PP has only one friend, only one friend in Congress, which is which is Vox, which is the extreme right. Pedro Sánchez can, and the PSOE and the socialists can manage to have more friends than 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 the PP does, and that's that's the way it is. And Pedro Sánchez is being able, um, still, of course, not very strong um, with lots of difficulties, but he is the only one right now that has that has the opportunity to manage those relationships with different parties that are important in Spain, small but important. Mm. But is that what the majority actually wants? Or again, is it is it giving disproportionate influence to parties that are on the fringes? No, it, it is true. Our system, our system is very uh, unproportional. Uh, mm. It is proportional in theory, but when you take into consideration the constituencies and the, the, the don't formula that, that is uh, using in the, um, in, the, uh, in the distribution of the uh, seats, etc., our system is very disproportionate, but it's, a, it's the system that is in our constitution since uh, 45, 50 years ago. So no one is going to change it right now. I mean, at least in the next uh, two or three months. But it's the, it's, it's the system that we have. Mm. It, it, gives, it gives lots of power to a small constituencies, to a small groups in the, region, in the regions. But that's the way it is. We're not going yeah. to change that in the next following well, Spain's months. not alone there. I mean, this is how the democratic system in a number of countries actually works. But uh, let me come back to something, Carlos. I can return to you. Uh, Alberto Núñez Fejú, Fejú called this a period of uncertainty coming that he thinks Spaniards will have to suffer for. How, what does he mean? Is he, is he overdramatic there? Or is this just a little bit of fear on his part that he actually might not be able to form a coalition and his adversary might actually be able to do so? Or is this uncertainty really bad for Spain? Yes, I mean, Alberto Núñez Fe, uh, Feijó's uh, speech yesterday night was, uh, was very tense. Uh, the People's Party uh, had a result that was nowhere near what they thought they were going to have. They were even speaking of... Uh, of being close to an overall majority uh, by themselves. That, of course, did not materialize. And uh, I'm not sure we can take uh, his words uh, last night as an indication of what's to come. I think that um, that they came as a shock. The results came as a shock to him, a very negative one at that. And uh, I mean, even some of the of the moments in that uh, balcony uh, in the in Alberto Nieto speech were very tense also because uh, because the crowds gathering around twice interrupted his speech to to, to call for for Isabel Ayuso, his potential successor, who was also in the back in the balcony. It was a, I think a pretty embarrassing moment for him as well. Mm. Um, the in terms of the uncertainty that's going to that's going to come, well, that much is clear. I think that there will be uncertainty as well when it comes to the leadership of the PP itself as well, and that's despite the, the, the clear improvement from 2019. The expectations were much higher for him 
and uh, and and to be honest, when it comes to the uh, to the uncertainty that both um, uh, major parties speak about, they only have themselves to blame, frankly, because uh, if we are talking about how undesirable it is to form a coalition with the uh, with Vox or to form a coalition which involves the votes of Bildu of the uh, of the independentist far left in the Basque country of the uh, Catalan independentist, why don't uh, Pepe and PSOE just form a grand uh, coalition? This is something that is not well understood abroad, and uh, really it's something that reflects pretty badly on both uh, on both parties, uh, mm. the fact that they don't seek to find an agreement between themselves precisely in order to avoid uh, depending on those, uh, on those minority parties. Uh, it is in their hands to do so, and they have never done it, and they won't do it. Mm, okay. Uh, Luis, do you think, I mean, it is, oh, we seem to have just lost Luis. Luis, if you're there, the grand coalition the, yeah. that Carlos was referring to, is that an option that politically both parties are just kind of maybe too selfish to actually explore, even if it might work better for the Spanish populace? No. No? No one expects, no one expects that big coalition right now, uh, the... The, 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 the two parties, the, the Popular Party and the Socialist Party, are, are the big adversaries uh, since the transition to democracy. Uh, they, they, they play together, they bat against each other, and no one expects a big coalition. The situation of the country is not in a, in a, in a crisis situation in which you really need a big coalition between, between the two typical adversaries. We are, the economy is growing quite well. Uh, we have a social peace, so to speak. Mm, there, we have many problems, of course, but the sensation, the, the, the perception by the city survey is that things go very well. There's no need for a big crisis coalition between the two parties. Mm, no one expects okay. that. Uh, let me ask you this then, Luis. Who do you think uh, in the electorate is more disappointed in the figureheads of their parties? Is it the right disappointed with their so-called leadership or is the left disappointed? Or right, they right now? Yeah. Yeah, right now, today, right now, today, of course, the left, uh, excuse me, the of right. course, the right. The right is, is very disappointed. The expectations were, were so high. Uh, Núñez Feijó was already thinking of him as, as president of the government, as prime minister. He was talking even in public about the, the likely uh, ministers that, that he was going to have. Uh, so the, 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 there's a deception, a clear deception right now. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, Sánchez uh, is, is right now much better than he was uh, yeah. Two months ago, no doubt. So, yeah, I mean, Carlos, you're, you're nodding in agreement. Uh, you think uh, Fejo was, was embarrassed by his, what could be seen as arrogance then, to, to be go as far ahead as to actually start choosing ministers and only to lose Absolutely. and be booed by his own I mean, people? I mean, the, the, the hobbies of, uh, on the part of, uh, of Fejo's campaign has been, uh, has been worthy of a, of a Greek uh, tragedy, frankly. <laughs> And uh, I mean, to the extent that uh, that Núñez Fijó did not go to the final televised debate in uh, Radio Televisión Española just three days before the election, he decided not to go. Pedro Sánchez was there, Yolanda Díaz was there, Santiago Abascal was there, and he didn't go. And uh, I think the official excuse was that uh, that he had some type of, of pain in his back. But the reality was that he was advised that he had already won okay. the election, and that therefore there was no point in him attending that debate. Uh, hubris, uh, mm -hmm. arrogance, and really a very bad strategy on uh, on the part of the People's Party. Luis, as a public relations advisor, he would not have advised him to behave the way he did in the last uh, in the last weeks of this campaign, I imagine. But just quickly, we're down to our last minute, uh, Luis. If you want to tell me for the immediate future where you see uh, the Spanish government going. You don't believe they'll, they'll be, it'll be necessary to call another election, but do you think a government, if built by the left, can actually hold and not prove totally dysfunctional? Of course, uh, of course, there, there's a real possibility of having of having a leftist uh, government uh, with Pedro Sanchez and Yolanda Díaz, with the support, uh, with the support, the 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 the, the conjunctural support, so to speak, of the of these small parties, and that's the possibility number one, scenario A. Uh, the scenario B would be the repetition of the elections. 
because no one right now here in Spain considers a possibility that Feijó uh, runs the government. Uh, that's that's almost right now impossible uh, here in Spain. Okay, Luis Arroyo, Carlos Conde Solares, that will have to finish our edition of uh, the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank you both so much for being with us. And our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.